we still have people entering, but uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Hi, everybody. I'm Matt Nicely. I'm a partner at Aiken Gump, Strauss, Hauer, and Feld in our Washington, D.C. office, where I practice international trade and customs law. I'm also president of the Customs and International Bar, International Trade Bar Association, or SITBA. And it is my pleasure to welcome you all to today's panel discussion on careers and internships in international trade, customs, and export controls law. We're pleased to be co-sponsoring this event with the International Economic Law Interest Group of the American Society of International Law, or ASIL. And uh, we're excited that you're all here and uh, we're now up to over a hundred of you. So uh, although there are over 200 folks who registered, so we may be getting a lot more people who join us shortly. Uh, our aim today is to spread the word to law students and recent graduates, particularly students and lawyers from underrepresented groups about just how cool it is to be practicing in this exciting field of international trade and customs. Uh, it is also just one component of SITBA and ASIL's broader efforts to do our part in addressing racism and racial injustice in our society and in our profession. Last year, the SITBA board established a committee on diversity, equity, and inclusion. We asked Irving Williamson to chair that committee, and we couldn't be more pleased to have him now as a member of our board of directors. Irv himself has logged over 50 years in our field. He served as Deputy General Counsel at the Office of U.S. Trade Representative and as a Commissioner at the U.S. International Trade Commission. I'm going to turn things over to Irv now and for him to provide a little more background on our DEI committee's efforts and to introduce our panel. I hope you enjoy today's, today's discussion. Thanks very much, Irv. Thank you, Matt. At a panel uh, SIPA held in September with five Black trade attorneys, we learned that in addition to doing more to promote and return blacks and other minorities, we also need to attract more, minor, more minority law students into the trade law field. As a first step, we are holding today's panel. The ASO International Economic Interest Group, which is chaired by Kathleen Clausen of the University of Maryland and Julian Arato of the Brooklyn Law School, also approached us about finding ways to help minority law students who want to gain international trade law experience by working at a government agency or nonprofit, but cannot do so because many of these internships are non-paying or low paying. So the two organizations are pleased to announce the SIPA ASO Summer Fellowship Program. This program will provide fellowships to assist students who get positions with government agencies or nonprofits. Further information and applications can be found on the SIPA.org website on the event page and of the website and also under the section called diversity pledge where we have our statement on diversity too. Uh, I've included in the chat for all attendees the link to the SIPA website and also a link to uh, the spot on the ASO website where they can find the application. The deadline for the application is April 2nd, so you have to move quickly. Also on the event page of the SIPA website is a link to a paper on international trade law internships and career opportunities at various law firms, government agencies, and courts. There is also a link to a chart on relevant international trade laws. We will be sending you and posting more information next week about uh, careers in international trade law and more details about the different areas that uh, different areas of practice that you may want to consider engaging in. Now, I'm very pleased to introduce the moderator of today's panel, Jalen Edwards Judelson. Jalen is a partner with the law firm of Bacon Gump. She focuses on, ex, on the export control area of international trade law. She is now based in Los Angeles. Since being at Aiken, she also worked in Washington, DC and spent two years in London working on Russian sanctions. So she's already had an interesting career. <laughs> Jason also heads Aiken's Black Firm Resources Group. Jason grew up in Lexington, Kentucky and attended the University of Chicago and Georgetown Law School. So I'm very pleased to turn the microphone over to Jason, Jason, uh, Jalen 
Julison. Thank you. Thanks so much, Irv. Um, I'm really excited to be here today. Um, it's, you know, we have a great set of panelists and I'm just thrilled that this resource exists for law students. Um, in terms of my, my own career path, as Irving mentioned, uh, you know, I spent most of my career in DC. I'm now based in Los Angeles. I've had a little bit of an opportunity um, to, to move around and experience different facets of international trade and international trade law in the private sector. But when I was a law student, I really had no idea what international trade law looked like. Um, I was really seeking to, to further understand that I knew I wanted to do something international, but I had no idea what that looked like when you were talking about the government or private practice. How did that fit into any of the practice groups? Was it its own practice group? Um, these were all questions that I really had. And it, that kind of drove what I was looking for in a summer program as a law student was the opportunity to see at individual firms kind of how that all came together and what that looked like in daily practice. Because I think, you know, in this area of the law, unlike, you know, maybe litigation where you can kind of point to a TV show and it's not exactly or necessarily even really close, but there are some general guideposts that align with what you might see on a on a day-to-day -day basis. And we don't have that to the same extent um, with international trade. I have felt really fortunate in the past couple of years as we've seen more, um, you know, ongoing geopolitical uh, negotiations with China that we're finally kind of seeing a bit a bit more that you can bring up at our now currently Zoom dinner parties to, to talk about um, the nature of the work that we do. Um, before I turn it over to introduce our great panelists today, I did want to just note that we have the Q and you should see on the bottom middle of the, the Zoom uh, platform, a Q and A um, icon. So if you have questions today really is more of a discussion to kind of help you understand our paths and, and answer any questions that you have. So please feel free to drop um, additional questions in the chat and I will, I will try to work those in um, as we can. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to Ruth Body, the Chief of Staff at the ITC to introduce herself and tell you a bit about um, her career path and interest in trade. Thank you, Jillian. Again, I'm very pleased to be here amongst all of you. And um, I think much like Jalen just shared, I had no idea what international trade law would mean as a career. So it's just sort of um, it's serendipitous that I ended up in this. I think, um, so going back a little bit, I also went to University of Chicago. So I didn't realize that until <laughs> Irv introduced you for undergrad. Um, and did my law school at Washington University in St. Louis, where I was also interested in doing something international, but didn't quite know what that entailed. Um, I, at the time, actually thought that I would be interested in doing public international law, which um, unless you're um, Amala Clooney, I think that's not really a career that that is available to most of us. So I ended up um, starting out in, sort of the intersection between trade and labor. And um, I was looking to, I thought I would do human rights work. So I, I was trying to find something in that space and ended up being a policy advisor to an organization that was advising multinationals in the US um, that were sourcing from Bangladesh. And I don't know if you'll recall, but there, there was a big uh, building collapse in Bangladesh that led to a coalition being formed that essentially was looking to improve conditions um, on the ground in Bangladesh, but also was um, supposed to improve trade relations between the US and Bangladesh because their generalized system of preferences status had just been rescinded. So um, I, that was sort of my first foray into trade, the trade world, and it was trade policy. Um, and, um, you know, I, upon realizing that I might need to permanently move to Dhaka, I, I started looking at more positions in DC and was um, in private practice for a few years at the law firm of Picard Kenson Row. Um, there I was doing largely anti-dumping and countervailing duty investigations representing domestic industries before the International Trade Commission, the Department of Commerce, um, the Court of International Trade and the Federal Circuit. Um, and after I got a taste of that, I guess I really liked it and wanted to get a little bit of government experience. So I transitioned to the ITC where I first started out in the Office of General Counsel 
advising the commission and helping draft opinions again on anti-dumping and countervailing duty cases. Um, I subsequently became a personal aide to one of the commissioners, Commissioner Kearns, advising him on those matters and also those related to what we call Section 337 that's um, are uh, related to unfair imports um, that impact U.S. intellectual property rights. I was also advising him on economic reports that the commission puts out. Um, and then most recently, um, I have now uh, become the chief of staff at the commission. So my work has shifted a little bit. Um, I don't do as much day-to-day -day case work, but um, I'm involved in just pretty much everything um, that the commission does on the management side, but also um, on the litigation side. So um, that's a little bit about my experience. Great, thanks so much, Bruce. Uh, I'm gonna transition now to Mercedes Morna, who is an associate at King & Spalding. Thank you, Jalen. Good afternoon. Uh, I am Mercedes Morno, and I am a trade associate with King & Spalding's Washington DC office. King & Spalding is an international law firm with 23 offices globally. Unlike Roop, I don't have an extensive work history, but I do have some. Uh, prior to joining King & Spaulding, I worked with the Office of the General Counsel at the US Department of Commerce. My primary focus both within the federal government and now in the private sector has been trade remedies. In line with what Roop mentioned, which is anti-dumping and countervailing duty law, trade remedies, includes measures applied by a government to level the playing field for domestic producers relative to unfairly traded products imported from abroad through the imposition of tariffs or duties. Now, what drew me to King and Spaulding uh, in part was the indication uh, during the interview process that I would have the ability to craft my work portfolio and pursue specific areas of interest. Since joining King and Spaulding, I've also expanded my work, my work portfolio or practice to include uh, regulatory trade compliance work. So essentially what we're doing is we're ass assisting US companies uh, as well as foreign companies with regard to matters that involve foreign investment in the United States and you know just a, reg a regular or popular reference here would be TikTok, for example. And uh, during my time with the firm, I have been privy to a number of efforts geared toward uh, diversifying the attorney population through substantive mentorship and scholarship programs geared toward producing tangible results for diverse recruitment and retention. By way of background, I graduated from Georgetown Law with a dual degree in, with a dual Juris Doctor and Master of Law, Masters of Law in International Business and Economic Law. After law school, I completed a, a federal judicial clerkship in New Orleans, Louisiana. And it is my absolute pleasure to serve on this panel this afternoon to discuss legal career opportunities in international trade. Thanks so much, Mercedes. Uh, transitioning now to Karita Wadi, who is the Assistant Chief Counsel at Customs and Border Protection. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. So happy to be here also. Um, like the rest of the panelists um, that have spoken so far, I knew nothing about international trade law and even less about import-export um, laws and the law surrounding. But I began my career with um, U.S. Customs as a third-year law student um, at Howard University. and um, I started on in February before my graduation in that on, in May, and um, had the opportunity through 3L, starting with the federal government. Had no real interest in starting with the federal government during that time. I just spent a lot of time hanging around the placement office, the career um, services environment at the time, and there were a number of interviews going on, and I decided to jump in and and try I'm my hand with um, U.S. Customs. So I have now been there for over 30 years um, after starting as a 3L. So there is so much um, to learn, so much to know, so much to do within government service, especially under the Department of Homeland Security and US Customs and Border Protection in particular. 
Um, I actually started my career in the Washington DC area. I worked there for eight years before being promoted to the Assistant Chief Counsel down here in New Orleans, where I've now been for over 25 years. Um, I cover a five state area, the Gulf region, Alabama, Tennessee, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Arkansas. And in that five state area, we have 17 different ports of entry. Of course, ports of entry can be either land, sea, or air. So I have a number of seaports and a number of airports here in my five state Gulf region area. Um, within Customs and Border Protection, we have over 60,000 employees. Um, three fourths of our employees are uniformed law enforcement officers. We have uh, um, blue shirts that you may see at the airport. They're known as our Office of Field Operations. We have the green shirts, which are the Border Patrol agents. And then we have the khaki shirts, which are Air and Marine. All of them work to serve in some capacity with international trade. Um, also, our mission um, in particular is threefold, and that is to protect the borders, um, to um, um, make sure that we have efficient trade and efficient travel. So just a little bit about CBP, and I'll be talking a little bit more about it later. Thank you. Thanks so much, Carita. Um, shifting now to Jeannie Coe, who's the Senior Corporate Counsel at Amazon. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks, Jalen. And I uh, appreciate Sipa and Ace Soul for sponsoring this program. It's really important, I think, to, to see a panel like this and to hear our voices. Uh, just briefly for my background, I grew up in Alabama and I got my undergraduate degree at Tulane University, like Roop, international relations, like I was gonna do something international, I didn't know what. Uh, and then my law degree comes from the University of Alabama. And then after law school, I was incredibly lucky to get a federal clerkship with Judge Sukalis, uh, who has since deceased at the Court of International Trade. And that was a great start to the career to get a, a wide exposure to different trade matters that came before the court that arose from the various agencies that are represented here today. Uh, and so after I did the two-year clerkship, I then uh, joined PricewaterhouseCoopers as a consultant in their indirect tax practice doing customs consulting. Um, and I did that for a couple of years and then I wanted to expand my practice a bit and joined a law firm in DC called Kroll and Mooring. Uh, where I did all range of import regulatory, you know, advising clients on import regulatory compliance, PGA compliance, customs, trade remedies, litigation, the, the whatnot. And then about four years ago, I joined Amazon as their customs attorney for the consumer business, which is essentially everything other than the cloud, right? So everything that the, the stores um, and the programs and the logistics behind the stores. Uh, and so doing that, you know, really it's day to day on trade compliance issues for the company, international expansion programs, um, and then also for a company like Amazon, it's global trade policy, because I didn't realize the last presidency was going to be as wild as it was. So that's been a fun ride. Um, and then last year. I switched roles and now I'm still at Amazon, but I oversee our global logistics legal team. So it's a slight pivot out of trade directly, but it obviously we, we touch a lot of the same themes, uh, which covers all of our cross-border logistics programs, both inbound and outbound to international customers. And it also includes our internal customs brokerage team. Great. Thanks so much, Jeannie. And then we have Shangwen Katari, who is the Executive Director of Lenovo. Um, hi everyone, thank you so much for having me. Um, I feel so honored to be serving on this panel with so many bright and talented attorneys, uh, it, particularly in trade, so this is, this is fabulous. So just a bit about my background, I think I have to echo the sentiments of, of my colleagues here, Jalen Roop and Krita and, and Ginny. Um, I didn't know anything about uh, international trade. Uh, I knew it was you know, international is something that I wanted to do. I graduated from the University of Illinois uh, with a political science and economics background um, and had focused primarily um, on international law. In, in law school, I went to the John Marshall Law School and I walked into the career office needing a job for the summer and uh, was lucky enough to um, be placed with an advisor that knew a third year law student who had clerked at the firm Burns, Richardson and Colburn and had indicated to me that she was, she was gonna be leaving that clerkship and that that would be an open position. 
So I talked with her, I reached out to the firm and was hired on as their law clerk as a, as a uh, second year law student. I then um, clerked at the firm until graduation, so all through, and then joined the firm shortly after graduation. I then also got my LLM in, uh, in international business and trade at the John Marshall Law School, in which one of the partners at the firm um, was also my professor. So it was uh, an, interesting, an interesting time, um, and it was a fabulous time at the firm. At the firm, it's, it was actually, it's a small boutique firm. It has offices in New York, Washington, and Chicago, and it focused on um, only international trade. So all we practiced was customs, customs compliance, uh, import-export, um, export compliance. Um, we also did a fair bit of litigation uh, with anti-dumping and countervailing duty issues. Uh, customs litigation, and then exports, uh, export controls. Um, I then became a partner at the firm in 2016, and then left the firm shortly thereafter when uh, this position sort of fell in my lap at Lenovo. Um, and so Lenovo sort of enticed me to, to leave and join them. And so about four years ago, um, I became their lead counsel for global trade. Um, at Lenovo, I oversee um, all of global trade. So not just the Americas, but I also advise pretty regularly um, on issues in, in Europe and the Middle East. Um, and then I, I run the team and I have a team of attorneys in um, AP in China, as well as in Latin America. Uh, so I was in that role, it, just in that role for um, three years. And then late last year, um, they decided to merge uh, both the, the trade legal group as well as the government relations group. And I am now also head of government relations. And it's much like Jeannie, this last three years or last four years have really been more about trade policy, um, trade compliance as well, export compliance as well, but also a lot of trade uh, policy. And so the organization decided to move both uh, the policy aspects and, and the trade aspects all under one one person. And so that's where I am today. Thanks, Shama. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I think when, when I started practicing, one of the, the myths that I heard was that it's very cyclical. There'll be, you know, quiet years or months, and then it'll pick back up. But I, I will say for different reasons, uh, I have not experienced that at least or the course of 10 years as we look at, you know, changes in policy and the underlying regulation. So um, it's certainly an exciting uh, area to be in. Um, I wanna shift now to uh, our, you know, some of the, the questions that um, we've received beforehand and to supplement with some of the Q&A ones that are coming through. Uh, we're gonna hear a lot of different perspectives, both from government, private sector, um, and, and private practice. So I did just want to note that um, in our responses to these, these inquiries, we're speaking from our personal experiences and on behalf of ourselves, but our responses are not um, to be attributed to our respective employers. I just wanna make that plug before we um, switch gears here. Um, the first question is for Mercedes. So we've been talking about um, deciding you know, a, 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 among different practice groups and how we're thinking about you know, export controls versus trade remedies. What drew you to international trade and your practice area and focus over other areas of law when you're considering? Thanks, Jalen. I think this is an interesting question for me. I think my pathway to international trade law has been a little bit different from the other panelists uh, because when I went off to law school, I actually wanted to practice capital defense work. And so I think, you know, the way that I found myself in international trade practice is by virtue of realizing what I did not want to practice and ultimately trying to pivot and develop a different avenue in terms of what my ultimate career would look like. So my summer after the first year of law school, I interned with the Northern Virginia Capital Defense office in uh, Arlington, Virginia. And that summer, one of our clients received a death sentence. And I think that pretty much did it for me. I said, this is not for me. 
as passionate as I am about capital defense work, I don't think that this is the sort of practice that I could see longevity in. And my first year I had taken an elective class in international law. And so I followed it up my uh, second year with an, another elective class in international trade law. And I took a course with Barry Cohen who has since passed away and he served as my mentor and provided me with insight into a number of different opportunities within the practice area, you know, from internships at the State Department, the Commerce Department, as well as internships abroad with law firms in Brazil um, and other, you know, foreign countries. And ultimately, you know, taking in his input and his advice, I ultimately served as a summer associate in a, at a law firm in Brazil. And essentially I was working with the firm's US clients in M&A, that is mergers and acquisitions, international trade, as well as labor and employment law. And I absolutely enjoyed it. It was honestly one of the most phenomenal experiences that I've had as you know, an intern or uh, you know, work experience or otherwise. And you know, it obviously didn't hurt that it was in Sao Paulo, Brazil, obviously. Uh, so ultimately, when I came back to the United States, I applied for an internship with the State Department, and I wound up spending an entire semester with the State Department's Office of the Legal Advisor. And I think at that point, my interest in international law had pretty much been solidified, but not yet within the space of international trade. So after my third year of law school, as I mentioned, I completed a federal judicial clerkship in New Orleans, Louisiana. And during my clerkship, I followed up with one of my uh, supervisors uh, from an internship that I had also completed at the Commerce Department. And she mentioned to me that there was this opportunity within a very, sm not, small but very nuanced office within the office of the legal advisor. And this office strictly handled trade enforcement and compliance. And she said, this would be perfect for you because I know you love litigation. And ultimately I wound up applying and started uh, within that office. And I served within that office for approximately four years. And, you know, it, it, you know, to put it bluntly, it far exceeded my wildest expectations. You know, just the opportunities that came along were just opportunities that I had not expected when I initially started. From, uh, you know, representing the United States before the World Trade Organization to, you know, working with the US Trade Representative to renegotiate the North American Free Trade Agreement to going on verification. Uh, with companies in Canada and as well as South Korea, you know, it was just, it was a, a, a very steep learning curve. Uh, but ultimately, I think at that point, I, I, I had solidified my interest within the international trade space. But again, as I mentioned, you know, it was really important for me to branch out a little bit beyond trade remedies. And so, since I've pivoted from the federal government and joined the private sector, that's essentially what I've been doing uh, in terms of expanding my practice beyond trade remedies to also include trade regulatory compliance work, as well as policy work and some pro bono work that I also complete. That's great and really helpful, Mercedes, uh, that you have experience kind of covering um, uh, both the, the government and private sector as well. Um, so the, the next question is specifically um, geared toward Customs and Border Protection. We have a few um, questions from the attendees about how second year students can seek opportunities at CBP. And um, I know, Karita, our next question was already, how did you kind of specifically find a job there? And what methods did you find um, were more effective than others? Okay, good question. I um, began my career, um, as I mentioned, um, as a third year law student. And during that time in the spring is when all of the law firms and the government agencies would come to do their interviewing process. 
I just kind of jumped in there just to get interviewing experience and just interviewed with anybody that I can get an interview with <laughs> at the time. So I was law review and I had worked with DC law students in court and I had done a, a number of other things. So I wasn't really sure what direction I really wanted to go in. So I learned about the Treasury's honors program. And at the time, the honors program encompassed all of the departments, all of the agencies that were under Treasury. You could go in, you would interview as an honor student, and you could get to actually um, go into the various agencies and find out more about them. Now, what I have learned is since now Customs and Border Protection is under the Department of Homeland Security as of 2003 when the agents, when that department was first created, there are 22 different agencies under the Department of Homeland Security. And they do in fact have the Department of Homeland Security honors program for attorneys. And you can apply um, in your third year um, between August and September, I think for the um, 2022 um, positions are going to be open in August. And through that program, um, you get to select four um, six month programs. It's a two year temporary position. And you go for four, month, for, for four different agencies for six months in each one. And at the end of that two year process, you can decide which agency you found um, most interesting and um, perhaps get a permanent position there. It's not a guaranteed permanent position, but Generally, you have a leg up. And also during that two year period, you get to see so many different agencies and other things that they do, including um, the US Court of International Trade. You, you look into um, USCIS, Citizens Immigration Services. You see um, Federal um, Emergency Management Agency, which is FEMA, um, the Transportation Security Administration, TSA. U.S. Customs and Border Protection, just so many different things that you can do under that Treasury program, um, under the Homeland Security program umbrella. So I strongly, strongly um, encourage um, 2Ls and 3Ls to look into that program. Um, salaries start um, depending on your experience. Um, if you're coming straight out of um, a, a law school, it's a GS-11 and you can look up those salaries for that if you've done a rotation um, or if you've been with um, uh, a judgeship, uh, a clerkship with a judge, I think it started at a 12. Um, if you've had some additional experience on a case-by-case -case basis, it may start as high as a 13, but it is definitely worth your effort in Googling and learning all that you can about the honors programs that are out there and the type of international trade experience that they have in those areas. Trade enforcement that Mercedes talked about, you can do a lot of that in those areas just to get a stepping stone. If it is your plan to go into private practice in the long run, this is one of the best places to start to get some background experience, to build your resume, to get a better understanding of what else is out there through government practice. So um, I wanna encourage those students that are interested in international trade to start with trying to get into the honors program. That's great, Krita. And we have a couple of follow-up questions related to whether CBP um, opens those programs to non-US citizens. Um, from what I understand, the honors program is for US citizens. Okay. Um, great, so I wanted to switch gears a little bit to talk about uh, one of the, the challenges that I think a number of us have mentioned about just understanding what day-to-day -day life is like when you are an international trade practitioner, like what are you doing each day? And I think it's really great. One of the, um, I think, uh, best parts about this panel is we have so many different perspectives on that. Um, so I wanted to start with uh, private practice with Mercedes um, and, and her current work at King and Spalding, and then we'll transition both to government and in-house as well, just to, to walk through what your, uh, your daily practice looks like and the types of issues you work on and the stakeholders that you most commonly engage with. Sure, thanks Jalen. Uh, this is another interesting question because I'd say that on a day-to-day -day basis, my, my practice tends to vary depending on the nature of the matters that I'm working on. Uh, my practice can be first 
described as administrative, that is as related to administrative law and our practice before US administrative agencies. And our firm, Tan Spalding, primarily represents domestic producers or domestic companies. So within this category, I primarily draft petitions for relief seeking the initiation of investigations to evaluate specific unfair trade practices presented by certain imports from uh, foreign producers or exporters. Once a proceeding is underway, uh, I will review documents and responses filed on behalf of those foreign producers and exporters, and if appropriate, draft a response. Second, I also handle work on the export side, as I mentioned, essentially guiding companies and individuals seeking to export items that may be subject to export restrictions. So within this category, I primarily draft due diligence questions to the client and draft legal recommendations on whether the item is subject to export restrictions, and if so, whether an exception can apply. In addition, I assist with counseling uh, both US and foreign companies in matters related to foreign investment in the United States. And within this area, we work closely with our corporate finance team to gather the necessary information on uh, the specific transaction. And we advise companies with regard to the calculated risk of whether or not to notify the US government of the transaction. And third, uh, as I mentioned, part of my work involves uh, the development of policy, practice and business development, as well as pro bono. Uh, my policy work uh, primarily involves internal discussions within the trade group, as well as the trade bar on issues that may impact domestic producers and domestic companies. Uh, the business development aspect of what we do could involve anything from putting together a webinar on the pharmaceutical supply chain, which arose during COVID-19, to drafting a client alert on recent developments that may be of interest to our clients. Uh, with regard to pro bono, I have the pleasure of working with the DC Volunteer Lawyers Project on a biweekly basis to counsel domestic violence victims on protective orders, divorce, and custody issues. To draw the common themes across my various matters, an average day could start with putting together my task list for the day, handling some research and drafting in the morning when I'm most productive. And in the early afternoon, I typically have calls scheduled with partners counsel or clients to discuss specific matters. And in the late afternoon and evening, I set aside some time to follow up with partners, counsel, or clients via email on any outstanding research or legal recommendations. Thanks, Mercedes. And shifting to government, um, Karita and, and Roop, what does your day look like? I'll start. Um, well, um, Particularly in my office, I'm a general practice office. So as I mentioned, the five states that we cover. So any legal matter concerning customs and border protection in the five state area may find its way on my desk. Um, about 20% of what we do is international trade law. And in the course of that practice, um, we are responsible for the early legal reviews of cases before they go to the Department of Justice. So if there has been an importation, a trade enforcement matter, an anti-dumping countervailing duty matter, it finds its way on my desk first. Um, we go through the entries, make sure we do research on the commodity, the importer. We work very closely with um, Homeland Security Investigation, that's um, Immigration Customs Enforcement, ICE as we know it. Those investigators work very closely with us on trade enforcement. Um, it can be any matter from um, particularly a case that I handled a year and a half ago um, concerning saccharin sugar that was transshipped from through China, um, well, from China through Taiwan. Um, that case took nine years to litigate, um, a lot of investigation, a lot of back and forth, dealing a lot with import specialists, um, understanding the commodity, having the investigators go over to Taiwan and do specific investigations 
with um, people that actually um, manufactured the saccharin sugar only to find out there were no uh, manufacturers of saccharin sugar at the time. Um, even though they said that's where the commodity was coming from, but we get really deep into the investigation of these matters, work really closely with the U.S. Attorney's Office um, on any of those matters. Um, also, always looking into um, violations of um, intellectual property rights, um, trade fraud. Um, we do uh, a lot dealing with um, marking cases. Um, so we work, like I mentioned, really closely with our um, our um, import specialist and our centers of excellence and expertise, which um, actually have specific commodities that they look into from petroleum to footwear, to textiles, to agricultural products. Each one of those are different centers of excellence and expertise that we work closely with and understanding the commodities, where they come from, understanding the importers and what we need to do to make sure that we're protecting trade as it comes into the US. I guess I'll go next. So um, I won't repeat a lot of the work that I think the anti-dumping and countervailing duty investigation work is similar to what Mercedes has described. But on the government side, you know, we're obviously preparing memoranda for our bosses. So as an aide to a commissioner on every single vote for a case, um, I'd be going through the record and providing a recommendation on how he should vote. And then also informing the opinion that comes out of the commission at the end um, on whether or not we go affirmative or negative in a given case. But I think the other side of what we do is sort of unique at the International Trade Commission. Um, since we are an independent agency, we don't necessarily work you know, for the administration, but we do have what we call our, our requester. So pursuant to statute, you could have um, congressional committees, the House Ways and Means Committee or the Senate Finance Committee, make a request to us on a specific trade issue um, and ask us to do a report. And it's also true for the US Trade Representative, representative on behalf of the president while they're engaging in negotiations over a trade agreement or whether um, they're looking at a specific issue and whether or not they should be imposing tariffs. Um, on a specific country, you can probably take a guess which one they might have been interested in recently. Those, all those questions come to us for sort of an independent technical assessment of um, how the, those committees and uh, the administration should proceed. So I think that's been sort of the interesting side of things for me now, in my, especially in my current role. I liaise a lot with, um, with the Hill and also with USTR on what they are looking for. Um, and, you know, we recently did a report on supply chain constraints related to COVID because our Congressional Committees of Jurisdiction was interested in that and said, what can you tell us? What are the limitations domestically? Um, so we did sort of a two phase report on that. Anytime there's a trade agreement, we also provide an analysis prior to the vote on uh, the, the Capitol Hill floor on how we uh, perceive the impact of that trade agreement domestically, right? So you would look at um, both a qualitative analysis and a quantitative one. So what does that do to GDP, for example? Um, so those are sort of other interesting things that we do um, in addition to sort of the anti-dumping countervailing duty side of it. So in my day to day, I could be involved in sort of engaging with those stakeholders, coming back to the commission and getting input from our bipartisan commissioners. So we've got a split, um, three Democrats, three Republicans, currently five, um, on how to proceed. So that's uh, so that's sort of, that's another interesting area. And finally, um, on the 337 work, which I briefly mentioned earlier on the intellectual property rights, that's also an interesting area. So you could have a scenario where you've got imports coming in that are infringing on intellectual property rights within the US, right? So that could be patents that are being infringed upon, trade secrets or trade dress. And the commission has to make that they review um, administrative law judges decisions to determine whether or not orders would go into place sort of banning those imports. And a lot of that work actually trickles to CBP eventually who has to enforce a lot of our orders that Karita just mentioned. So I think a lot of our worlds are sort of um, intertwined in a lot of ways. Um, but yeah, I could be I could be spending time preparing those memos, engaging in those meetings. Um, and in my current role, a lot of the sort of agency wide policy making as well um, and, and the management end of things. Great. Thanks so much. Ruth. Um, so we're going to shift to a uh, discussion of the in-house perspective to, to Shama and Jenny. There are also a few questions in the chat about 
opportunities as they might exist outside of DC or New York. So I did just want to flag that as well as you consider your response. Sure. I'll start with you. So I guess I'll go ahead and start. Um, so a typical day at Lenovo, at least uh, my day, starts pretty early in the morning because I do um, manage the entire trade group as well as the government relations group. So invariably, I'm either dealing with a, a group of stakeholders that are located um, maybe in, in Asia Pacific. So it's, you know, it may be their nighttime and I might need to be on a call with uh, people in Europe sort of at the same time. So my day starts very early, typically with conference calls. And I then move into responding to a number of emails and issues really concerning um, trade compliance, uh, both on the import side, um, either into the Americas um, or the EU or the Middle East, or on the export side. On the exports, it's, it's generally been um, U.S. export controls around the world, um, whether our products are subject to U.S. law, even though they're manufactured abroad, um, understanding um, and navigating the new rules that we've seen come down um, from some of the um, government agencies like the uh, Department of Commerce's Bureau of Industry and Security, um, and then also monitoring the news um, because of my government relations hat. I do try to stay on top of what's happening around the world. Um, I do monitor issues that directly impact Lenovo. Um, so that would be essentially anything involving manufacturing and supply chain, cybersecurity, uh, data privacy, um, as well as um, uh, other, other aspects of product compliance, uh, particularly with respect to some of the new um, issues we're seeing as in 5G um, and, and keeping on top of those issues and briefing the, um, uh, briefing both the chief legal officer as well as other um, uh, uh, leaders in the business around the world. I also quarterly do have a dotted line into the board. So I do have to make board presentations, particularly around um, trade and, and government relations and, and um, sort of what's happening in the world and how Lenovo is situating itself to deal with some of these uh, issues, the geopolitical issues that affect us around the world. Um, I then also manage my team. So I often have team meetings um, every week where we talk about what are some of the um, ac issues we can deal with proactively to improve compliance around the company around um, both import and export. So we will, um, you know, we will put together a number of trainings that we give online um, as well as live trainings. Um, we might be engaged in a particular project that we want to look into, um, you know, the Last year's project involved reviewing our transfer pricing policy in a, in a global company. Um, often there are tax issues that could affect value. And you know, when, when a merchandise is valued in a certain way, it's then um, the value is used to calculate duties. And so what we wanna do is confirm that we are paying the correct amount of duties on import um, in the different countries that we do business and make sure that we're properly paying the duties and, and, and then going back and confirming that we've calculated the value correctly. Um, and the reason for that, it's, it's not just, you know, you see a price and that's the value. It's mostly because we have a lot of, um, a lot of um, yeah, intercompany uh, transactions. We wanna be sure that we have a, you know, following and compliance with the transfer pricing policy. Um, you know, that the policy has been approved by most government um, agencies and, and sort of confirming that. Um, we also deal with a review of whether, um, you know, I work with the marketing teams, for example, uh, because they, they have specific issues that come up with concern to origin, sometimes marking a product a particular origin, whether it's, it's in one um, developed or designed in one country, assembled in another, maybe manufactured in another, you know, what is the origin of that country? Um, it's, you'll be surprised, but sometimes it's not what you've expected. It's not the, the last country in which um, um, assembly occurs. Sometimes it's other countries. So, you know, working with them, designing the marking, making sure it complies with the laws um, in the countries that we do business. Um, so that is, you know, a typical 
uh, day in, in sort of in Lenovo. With respect to potential opportunities outside of Washington, D.C., you know, I'm a lawyer that, you know, I'm a trade lawyer. I've always been a trade lawyer in Chicago. And um, there are a lot of boutique firms. We have we have several boutique firms within the Chicagoland area that all they do is practice customs and international trade law. And it's uh, there's one called Sandler Travis and Rosenberg. And there's Barnes, Richardson, and Colburn, um, and uh, there are several others with a fairly large and significant trade practice. Um, so you definitely consider looking in Chicago. Within the multinational companies, um, like our company, for example, we do sometimes um, have internships for law students. Our headquarters in the U.S. is located in North Carolina for Lenovo. Um, I sit in the subsidiary headquarters, um, Motorola Mobility, and that's located in Chicago. So sometimes we have internships available for law students. Um, you know, so you know, right now everything is remote, so I don't think we are necessarily geared towards a particular area. Um, but as offices open up again, and you find yourself in North Carolina for a summer, or you find yourself in Chicago for a summer, we very well might have a position available for um, a summer uh, a summer clerkship. And just to interject, we have um, a few questions that have come up related to opportunities for non-US person law students, and also individuals who have a law degree from outside of the United States and how they might think about um, uh, how they make you about using that or where they should kind of focus when applying. And um, Jeannie, I know it was next to you. We were pri the private private practice and um, private companies hire non-US citizens kind of all the time and have overseas offices and engagements with local council. Um, so how, how have you seen that kind of play out or, or come up in, in your daily work? Absolutely. Thanks, Jalen. Uh, I would say that you're absolutely right. Companies and firms that have, inter even the government, right, have international presences now. And so uh, your opportunities are not limited to just DC or New York or, you know, where you would consider traditional uh, centers of trade. Uh, we have attorneys that are the EMEA lead for trade. You know, we have an APAC lead. Other companies have similar verticals where we have those roles. Additionally, you know, I've engaged with CBP officials that are based out of, of Brussels, right, that are the liaison officer for the European Union and other opportunities like that. So there's a lot of international opportunity out there. Um, I would say that my co-panelists are incredibly polite because they've described their day very, you know, robustly in terms of what they do. I'll sum it, I'll simplify it. Our business clients, our customers, our, our clients, stakeholders, et cetera, they come to you with a pile of poo and they need help sorting through the facts. That's really what it comes down to for all of us, right? And they are coming to you with a, a jumble of facts and they're trying to figure out, can we do something or we've done something? How do we fix it? Um, and you just help them sort through the facts, issue spots, just like law school. You issue spot. What are the key issues? What are what's the prevailing law for those issues? How do we interpret that law or regulation in a way that makes sense for the client? Right? How can they operationalize it? What are the right risk factors that's going to work for this team, this program, this client to implement those changes? And then working with them to make sure that whatever they put into play is going to work, right? It's going to be legal, it's going to be compliant, it's going to protect the company, enable them to move forward with their business. I think ultimately, that's kind of how we we simplify what we do every day um, as an attorney in the field. And so whether your client's an internal client or an external client, that's how it works. And then for trade, you're just complexifying the issues because you're dealing with multiple countries, right? You're dealing with um, an issue that could impact 10 countries, maybe not just one. You're, because we're all working on the same uh, framework, uh, you know, under the WTO for like customs valuation or like that Shama was mentioning or, you know, origin or whatnot. And so I think that that's, if I were to distill it down into two minutes, that's kind of the essence of, of what we do day to day. And essentially our stake, our business clients are just different. Right, whether it's the the U.S. people, um, an agency, or a private client, or a company, or an internal stakeholder, the clients are different, but the work's pretty similar in that sense. And I would also encourage that 
a, a lot of us were able, we're very fortunate to start in trade, but a lot of um, my friends have blurred the line. Like I spent a few years at PricewaterhouseCoopers, which is a non-attorney, non-practicing role, right? I was a consultant because they're an accounting firm. And I also have friends who have bridged from being on the business side, meaning they were a trade compliance officer or led a trade compliance team and, you know, kind of moved back and forth from the legal side of the house to the business side of the house. And I think that that fluidity among roles is more common today than it used to be. And so um, don't be so limited in, in your mindset in terms of what w- is international trade and what that career could look like. And, you know, you may not get to exactly where you think you want to get to right out of law school. It's very rare to do that. It's more of you're kind of incrementally working in that direction and jump on that next great opportunity that works for you. And then, you know, over time, you build up such a depth of experience that I think uh, companies, employers, business, you know, uh, firms, the government will come looking for you because you have that wide depth of experience that represents multiple stakeholders that are all playing in this field. Yeah, I think that's a a really great point. Um, I, I, it's unfortunate we only have um, a few more minutes in today's uh, panel because I think there's just so much to discuss here. Um, but your, your last point, Jeannie, about it may not look exactly like you think, I think is, is really important because um, some of the questions asked about, you know, kind of what resources, how they can get involved if they haven't yet had the opportunity to um, work specifically in international trade. And I would really encourage, you know, the, the law students to um, leverage their networks and even those with especially with work experience that is related to international trade. And I think one of the, you know, uh, kind of missteps when you're very junior in your career is not thinking that your existing network can be really valuable to you. And it absolutely can. It's a very small trade world. And you're, you know, I find I'm typically only kind of one step removed from you know, having a, a, a very close and common person that, you know, I know or um, that we, we have a previous work history that aligns. So I think that's, that's one great way to get your foot in the door. Um, also, think about professional associations that you can volunteer your time and work with, because I, I think that one common element across uh, government, private practice, private sector businesses is that there just isn't time to really think about and explore everything that's developing kind of simultaneously. And that's a great way to kind of add value right away and build those connections. So there's professional membership associations, SIPA, ASIL, um, are really good for building your networks and making those relationships that will give you a foot in the door and an introduction to find that next step from a career perspective as well, um, in addition to, to great mentors also. Um, so I, I think it's, it's so tough, but we unfortunately are at the top of the hour. I know we didn't get to every question. Um, I, I really wish we could have, but I also love that I think we have a lot of great guideposts based on your questions for future events as well. Um, I think, you know, for all of us, uh, one of the, in particular for me, I'm a co-chair of our uh, Black Firm Resource Group, uh, DNI is something that's really important to, to Aiken, as I know all of our um, companies and represented here today. Uh, so these ongoing discussions, I think, will be something we'll you know, continue going forward and, and make sure that we can offer uh, additional resources and panels and discussions as they are helpful to all of you. Um, thank you to, to all the panelists. really appreciate everyone um, dialing in and making the time today. And we look forward to uh, staying in touch and um, providing additional resources as you have um, questions about careers.